I welcome you. I am Sudhir Pandey. I welcome again to Ahmedabad University and to the Amrit Modi School of Management uh, Conversation Series webinar. Uh, today we are really delighted to have uh, Talmiz Ahmed ji. Uh, Talmiz Ahmed uh, joined the Indian Foreign Services in 1974 and served as uh, Indian Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 2003 to 2011, Oman 2003 to 4, and UAE from 2007 to 10. He was additional secretary for international cooperation in the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas in 2004 to 6 and in 2006 to 7 he was the director general of the Indian Council of World Affairs New Delhi in July 2011 the Saudi government conferred on him uh, the King Abdul Aziz medal first class for his contribution to the promotion of Indo Saudi relations after retirement from foreign services he worked very briefly uh, in the private sector for the en energy company in Dubai Uh, one of the uh, uh, prominent features about uh, Talmi ji is that he is not only the diplomat or the person who works for the uh, uh, international affairs, but whatever he sees, he reflects on them and reflects like an academic. And that's how he has written uh, very interesting books. So he wrote uh, several books apart from the one that he has written recently. Like first one was Reform in the Arab World: External Influences and Regional Debates in 2005, and Children of Abraham at War: The Clash of messianic uh, militarism in 2010 and more, one more and the second last one is the west uh, about the west asian country uh, so we are truly honored to have you uh, uh, mr karmi rahman and and welcome to amdavadi university thank you very much uh, the person who will be in conversation with talmi is our own professor meenal pathak uh, she is from amrit modi school of management she is currently a senior scientist uh, of working group 3 of the intergovernmental panel on climate change which is called ipcc uh, this uh, the working group 3 where she works uh, that covers the mitigation of climate change that is methods for reducing emission of greenhouse gases and enhancing atmospheric uh, sinks the working group, group 3 technical support unit is based at the global center for environment and energy at andabad university so at andabad university uh, in amrit modi school of management we have certain centers like center for heritage management and uh, we are thought leader in global center for environment and energy and she coordinates all the efforts at the center for environment and energy at uh, amdavad university and uh, uh, she has a visiting uh, researcher at uh, uh, position as a visiting researcher at imperial college london and has held visiting scholar position at the department of urban studies and planning at mit uh, and several other universities and she is widely published so we are uh, grateful to you professor minal patak to be in conversation uh before i hand it over to you there are certain rules uh, except these two speakers everybody will be muted throughout the conversation and if you are joining joining with your mobile i request you to rename yourself so that uh, uh, we know who you are and uh, when the conversation will be on for the next 50 55 minutes we would request you to put your questions we'll curate your questions and come back to you at the end of uh, uh, the conversation and we'll take all the questions so thanks everybody for joining and uh, i request professor minal patak to take it forward Thank you so much, Sudhir. Can you just confirm that you can hear me clearly? Yes, uh, very clear. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And first of all, let me just say, Talmiji, that it's an absolute honor for me to be speaking with you today. And uh, I, uh, as I mentioned uh, over our exchanges, that I did have uh, the opportunity to read your recent book, which I found was very interesting. Uh, the narrative of West Asia, uh, starting from the 18th century and then going into a very detailed account of the region's politics over the last hundred years. Um, and you describe the years of colonial rule under the British, the French, and more recently the U.S. invasions, and uh, uh, the region uh, with all its resource abundance, the wealth, the oil, strong cultural forces, has also been subjected to series of conflicts, wars, uh, violence, and resource scarcities. And at one point in the book, you say uh, uh, you say that despite all this, the region uh, is doomed. and so uh, and and I, i really want you to introduce the readers to the geopolitics of the region uh, as you describe in the first two chapters of your book yes. over to you sir the the region has been uh, extremely unstable uh, uh, largely due to the intervention of foreign powers in the politics of the region these foreign powers uh, after they had dominated the ottoman empire uh britain and france took direct control over the region and after the first world war actually created the borders in west asia so they gave shape to the countries that emerged and continued to exercise political and economic control over the region 
uh, from uh, uh, earlier, uh, the uh, British were interested in dominating the Gulf because that was the pathway to India. But from 1908, oil was discovered and the strategic value of oil was such that it was immediate, it made the region extremely important for Western powers. The value of oil was immediately apparent during the First World War and then even more significantly in the Second World War. And as the region entered, as the world entered into the Cold War, it was very clear that Western powers were never going to allow uh, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union or its allies to enter the region and exercise a degree of domination here. So you could say that the politics of the region has been defined by Western domination overwhelmingly. This domination initially was direct in the shape of colonial and imperial rule. Later on, it was indirect in the way they controlled the rulers and the ruling families that dominated different countries in the region. So it is an indirect control, but they also maintained a certain degree of authority over the economic policies of the region. Also, you find that the region that had emerged as a result of Western intervention was insecure and unstable. As you can see, many of the countries that were given shape were never able to look out for their own security. They were inherently and from the very outset dependent on the West for their security. So this is a pattern of uh, state building by Western powers, whether it is Pakistan or Israel or these Gulf countries or the various West Asian countries, all of them are so structured as to be inherently unstable and insecure and always dependent on Western power. So this is a pattern. So these countries too uh, uh, depended on Western powers for their sustenance. And uh, then the Western powers ensured that you would, that the interests of the rulers, interests of the royal family were conflicted with the interests of the country. So there was no separation between them. So it is not as if state security and ruling sec ruler security were separated. No, it was the same. So this is how the West has dominated the region. Now, periodically, the reason for so much instability, periodically, countries, uh, people in the region would oppose it. Therefore, you will see that while the main title of my book is West Asia at War, it is a very significant, the significance of politics in the region, significance of the politics in the region is that the region, there is persistent resistance, uh, resistance to this kind of state order, resistance to external intervention and uh, in resistance to domestic tyranny. So this is a consistent pattern. Uh, so you have repression on the one hand from the existing state order aided and abetted by Western power and you have resistance to this and you have constant interplay in the domestic politics of the region of the great power uh, that are uh, uh, that pursue their own interests in the region from time to time, including with very robust military no, uh, that, that is, yeah, I, I agree. And there are many other uh, reasons, but I come to oil because you mentioned this and it is of interest also for India, but also to the listeners and from my personal research on climate change that you talk about this oil uh, oil field that was discovered in 1908. Um, and then um, it was huge. And we found that it could actually change the fortunes of the region. And gradually, uh, more and more uh, concession agreements started happening between the colonial powers and the local region rulers. And then you had uh, these companies coming in. And uh, as oil explore exploration increased, um, the I think by mid-century, the, ruler the rulers thought that this, uh, this is not a fair bargain, that we shouldn't only get the royalties because the companies are making a lot of profits from the oil. And, and they're, they're, that led to the dominance of the region. They recognize that this is a very powerful resource that we have. And yet we are here um, uh, in this year, 2022. Um, what, what do you think 
And like, how would you describe the region's uh, energy dynamics with respect to oil as of today? Yes. Uh, the region is significant in world affairs because of its oil. Uh, the Gulf alone has 50% of world reserves. And if you add Iran and uh, in, uh, Iraq, the reserves are even greater. Not only do they have these reserves, they are also very major exporters, uh, both of oil and now increasingly of natural gas. So this region is central to global energy economics. And because energy is, a, is of strategic value, obviously the region has an extraordinary importance far beyond it would have had if this energy wasn't there, if the energy resources were not there. It, has, you know, it would have had a significance as a center for uh, Islamic pilgrimage, mm. uh, et cetera. Mm. But uh, because of energy, Energy has generated uh, finances, funds. So it is not only a global energy center, it's a global financial center as well. It has also attracted a very large number of international companies to develop infrastructure and welfare projects in the country. So it has a great commercial value. And it is a major employer of expatriates. Several million expatriates have flocked to the Rui region over the last 40 to 50 years and have participated in the development of this region and have sent back remittances, which are very crucial for the economic welfare of their home countries. So you can see a very large number of factors that have enhanced the importance of the region because it is, uh, because it is the world global center for energy resources. And the world is dependent on energy. I mean, let us be very clear that oil and gas contribute more than uh, 45 to 50 percent of uh, the global energy mix in certain countries, if it is more so. Mm -hmm. And if you add coal to this, fossil fuels between them uh, contribute about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the global energy mix. And this scenario is not expected to change very dramatically in coming years. Uh, uh, many of the projections that have been made by different authorities indicate that coal, oil and gas will contribute over 25% each to the global energy mix, at least up to 2040. And my own sense is it may be up to 2050 as well. So the region is important globally because of the energy resources that it has, the finances that it is able to generate, the projects that are taking place over there on a constant basis, and above all, the employment that it is able to give large sections of the international community. Thank you. I want to come to India's dependence on oil, but but before that, there is a conflict in my mind uh, <coughs> regarding climate change, and I must raise it. <laughs> so I also work with the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the latest report, the sixth assessment report that came out in April this year, um, shows very um, alarming findings about climate change and that how far we are from where we need to be in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the report uh, shows that if we are to, to um, reach the, or meet the global ambition for mitigation to limit warming to 1.5, uh, we will have to peak our emissions by 2025, which means that we cannot continue the existing pathway uh, that relies on coal, gas, and oil, basically fossil fuels. And so these assets will have to decline. Uh, these assets will have to retire and the use has to decline. So uh, the report, I mean, we don't have an exact value uh, now, but the report shows that the economic impacts of these stranded assets could be trillions of dollars. And while coal assets are most vulnerable, but oil and gas assets are also vulnerable towards mid-century. So given that this region has so far enjoyed uh, economic gains because of fossil fuels, now with climate change, how do you see this um, uh, reconciling with the, the idea that the region still depends and wants to grow on the basis of the resources it has? Uh, firstly, I must assert that I'm completely in agreement with you with regard to the seriousness of climate change-related challenges. 
there can be no denying the fact that this is of extreme importance as far as the future of humankind is concerned. But I have worked in the field. I'm a student of energy affairs. I have worked in our Ministry of Petroleum. So in my presentation, I have no choice but to bring in an element of realism, a kind of reality check. What have I actually seen? I have actually seen that large sections of the international community give lip service to concerns relating to climate change but are not yet ready to effect the transition that is required from fossil fuels to clean energy. Let us be very clear over here. What is the reason? The reason is economics. The transition requires such extensive investment over such a long period of time that the international economy simply does not have those kind of resources. And the effect that they will make as far as climate change mitigation is concerned is so much into the future. If you are a government, particularly a democratic government, you have absolutely no choice but to provide energy security to your people today. What is energy security? Availability of energy resources at affordable prices to maintain the lifeline of the lifeblood and lifeline of the people concerned. You cannot move away from existing fuels that are powering your economy. And let us be very clear, if India and countries like India and China are rich in coal resources, they are not going to give up on those resources because something else is uh, advocated by climate change mitigation people. Also, the kind of the whole structure of economic infra of energy infrastructure is such that it is geared today for uh, fossil fuels, particularly oil and gas. Will this change? Of course it will. We have seen over several centuries when we analyze the shift from one source of energy to another, of course there has been change. And the change has been very slow and extremely gradual. The Industrial Revolution marked the shift from human power, animal power, and wind power to coal and steam. And as a result, you had the Industrial Revolution. Coal dominated the global economy for a century and odd. Then you had oil. Why did oil slowly replace coal? Because it was more efficient. And you had the invention of the internal combustion engine, and it was much more efficient. It occupied less space and gave a much more in return. When alternative fuels are able economically to become, to, uh, are able to challenge the uh, kind of investments that are required in traditional fuels, you will see the change. It is not, no change will occur on the basis of pious statements at major conferences. They will, only economics will affect this change. And it's a very profound change. For example, a shift from uh, oil into electric vehicles. It's a very, very significant national transformation. You need to have a major infrastructure all across the country so that you will have new kinds of service stations that will be able to provide the energy required by these new vehicles. You will need new kind of technology, new kind of support services, new kind of people, personnel trained for this. It's a very long and extremely expensive process. So what I have seen happening at energy at climate change conferences, they announce a certain uh, target it's very often not enforceable to us as far as anybody is concerned, and then get on to the and get on with the rest of their normal life. This is not going to help unless technology is able to become much more economical and compete robustly with uh, traditional fuels. You're not going to see any change at all. And I am suggesting to you all the literature that I have said uh, that I have seen. Traditional fuels, coal, oil, and gas are going to dominate the global energy mix to the extent of 75 to 80 percent, at least for the next 20 years, 
and possibly for the next 30 years as well. That is uh, not great news for climate change. But yeah, I agree with you that it's it's really hard to change the world order. It will just have to redefine the way people live, work, travel, eat, uh, source their food and necessities. And I'm not seeing that change. <laughs> Although on the positive side, I, I did recently, I mean, I think in 2021 at the climate conference, Saudi Arabia announced a net zero target for 2060, I believe. So... I think the region also recognizes the need to shift away, but like you said, it may not happen overnight. So are you aware of, would you throw a light on the fact that, well, these economies realize that, but they are they are sort of constrained uh, by the lack of finances and this being the major source of their economy. And therefore the shift will be gradual. So they are actually progressing towards diversifying to renewables because they have a lot of solar resources as well. See, the major oil and gas producers are energy dependent. And they have the wisdom to realize that at some stage there will be energy transition. And obviously you have to prepare over a long term in order to be competent, in order to be able effectively to handle the transition. But you have a fundamental paradox. And the paradox is this. If I am going to be asked to invest in the long term, and the long term is like 40, 50, 60 years, what do I invest for today? If you will see very objectively, many of the problems that we are facing today with regard to instability in the global energy scenario is due to the fact that in response to climate change mitigation and transition commitments, there was significant reduction in the development of traditional energy resources. And therefore, post-pandemic, when the world demanded more energy, it was simply not available. And the oil producers very rightly could say to us that you prevented billions of dollars being invested in the development of new resources that the world needs. And therefore, you have instability. So you have to have a balance. And I'm not sure that balance can be very easily met. But the balance is you need to continue to invest in traditional resources in order to ensure that energy markets are stable, while at the same time also invest in the technology that will facilitate transition over a longer period of time. It's a very fundamental paradox. And there is no easy solution no. because governments don't have money for these two separate uh, commitments. No. You can't, I mean, you're talking about trillions of dollars. If governments that have announced the certain targets over a period of no. time, no. that transition requires an investment of four or five trillion dollars over the next few years. Where is that money? We have, as a result of the pandemic, we are suffering from global recession. Mm -hmm. We have not recovered from that. And because of the energy, uh, energy problems, aggravated by the foolish pol policies from the United States and the energy crunch created in Europe, you have inflation because energy costs have gone up. You have inflation on the one hand and recession, and recession on the other. And you have serious issues of unemployment. All of these are extremely sensitive factors as far as the political elections are concerned. And no government is going to go into elections while the country is energy insecure. Therefore, you will find constantly. I support your advocacy. But the point is, you are at this stage fighting a battle that you cannot win. We are, we are all. <laughs> but yeah, um, I also actually wanted to transition to another issue related to climate change, but not directly, which is food security. And 
and while and you mentioned in this book that destiny would remain unkind to this region and while they will have this challenge of moving away from fossil fuels they also have this challenge of uh, meeting the food security and a recent report says that uh, Yemen and Syria in particular are in the middle, already in the middle of a food crisis and the region is the most affected region in the world uh, because of uh, water shortages because of climate change uh, and given that the region is majorly dependent on imports for food, uh, the, the additional problem of land degradation, which has intensified in the last decade. So given the new challenges of food security, and now with the Russia-Ukraine conflict as well, uh, and the challenges to receiving the, the still, I mean, in the older order also, we were, uh, the imports were at least stable, but now the instability alongside all these environmental challenges. How do you see see the, the region able to manage this food security crisis? And Even before see? the war in Ukraine, which has created serious disruptions in food supply, both from Russia and from Ukraine itself, you had problems of food. Uh, we had, it's linked with climate change, absolutely, no doubt about it. It is one of the very negative implications of climate change, where you see extraordinary heat, you have drought, you have floods, you have all kinds of disruptions in ordinary people's lives. And very often, the food that they had uh, uh, planted in normal times, is damaged and, and uh, destroyed. So there was already a serious problem that was uh, uh, being experienced by us, aggravated further by economic disruptions caused by the pandemic. As far as West Asia is concerned, food has been a very serious challenge for the rulers and the people. Why have we not discussed it so far today? Because the region overall was seen as having such resources that it could purchase food from yeah. all over the world wherever required, mm -hmm. store it extremely well in high-tech mm -hmm. silos and other capacities, and then at subsidized rates, make it available to them. As you know, the political order in the Gulf and many other oil-producing countries has a social contract where there is an authoritarian system that justifies itself on the basis of welfare, security and welfare for its people. And subsidized food is part of that welfare program. But you have a lot now. Therefore, as a result, what has happened? As a result, every country in West Asia and North Africa is a food importer. Mm -hmm. Even countries that traditionally were famous as food producers, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, and Sudan. They were breadbaskets for the world. In fact, human civilization emerged that in Iraq and of Syria course. because of, and in Egypt because mm -hmm. of the uh, because of the rivers uh, mm -hmm. that fertilized the soil. All of these have become very serious importers of food because their own production at home has gone down very significantly. The soil has been very badly damaged. And because they are oil producers or have access to resources, uh, they are able to import food. Mm -hmm. But now you realize that when you have disruptions due to geopolitics, mm -hmm. you are not going to depend. Where is that food when you mm -hmm. want to? Importing food is a fair weather arrangement. Mm -hmm. The moment you have some kind of conflict, some kind of conflict and disruption, all shutters will come down, and you will not be able to. Uh, you will not be able to get the food that you need. As indeed it is true of energy as well. That just when you need energy, you will find if there is a conflictual scenario, you will not be able to access either food or energy when you need it. So you, we have a problem. There is therefore the need for a global commitment, not only to address issues of food and uh, climate, but also issues of geopolitics. 
countries do not have the luxury of deciding to go to war, aggravating tensions in region, and then expecting that everything else will go normally. There mm -hmm. are there is a price to be paid. There are consequences to certain decisions that are made by governments in a set of circumstances that have extraordinarily negative implications for various uh, countries. And we are, we are looking at that. I think food, the kind of food crisis we are going through today is something that is a very serious warning. It's a warning for us in India because mm -hmm. we have been yeah. complacent because of the green revolution all mm. those decades ago, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Mm. And we now know that mm. there is need for a significant upgradation of our production at home if we mm. are going to be able to feed people effectively. Mm. We, uh, many people, I'm not an authority on agriculture, but many people who are better informed have rang alarm bells in this regard and have warned the authorities concerned that we are not doing as well as we should, both with regard, with regard to production, storage, distribution and that vast numbers of extremely vulnerable people are going to be very seriously affected by this. Thank you. I'm already seeing some interesting questions on chat, but I think I would like to request the listeners, maybe um, we can take the questions in another 10 minutes or so, because I still had a couple of things that I wanted uh, Mr. <coughs> Ahmed to, to enlighten us on. And, uh, and it has come up in the questions already, but but I want to I want to hear your views and you you have been very um, I mean you have eloquently mentioned this in your interviews and also in your book. But recently we've seen the West flip flip flop on uh, on Saudi Arabia. Um, you talk about Trump and then Joe Biden and Joe Biden um, saying things about Saudi Arabia's conference and then doing a complete about turn. And now it's um, it's a recent friendship, so to say. Uh, and collaborations and the new initiatives I to you two and quad two. So how do you see? How do you see? And and I know in your book you give a very interesting narrative of 9/11 and Al Qaeda and the formation of the Islamic State. And I don't know how you can compress your answer in in a short time that we have. But we would really be interested to hear. Oh, I would encourage everyone to read my book. <laughs> I will uh, encourage having, everyone to read your book. This, Here it is. Having said this, let me stick to what is going on now. After the nightmare of Donald Trump, the world had very high expectations of Mr. Joe Biden. We saw him as a person of experience, of moderation, of maturity, of good sense. But this year and odd he has been in power has been a consistent and indeed sustained disappointment. The kind of clarity of thought and the kind of robust leadership that was expected from the United States after the turbulence and chaos of Donald Trump has not been forthcoming. You find a president who is unsure of himself, has no clarity with regard to policy approaches. He doesn't seem to be physically all there, many physically and mentally all there many times. And there is therefore a deep sense of despondency about the quality of leadership emerging from the United States. But there is a deeper and larger problem. And that is the United States today is a very deeply polarized country. Indeed, it is so polarized that its political order possibly is today thoroughly dysfunctional. It is recognized and understood. Now, here you have Mr. Joe Biden on the campaign trail consistently abusing Saudi Arabia, calling it a pariah state on the one hand, and saying he will have nothing to do with the crown prince. Is that a statesmanlike approach? Is that how you treat an ally who has been your strategic partner from 1945? It was an extraordinary case of immaturity, emotional uh, emotions getting away from good sense and wisdom. And then what happened? Without any planning, without any consultation, the United States on 8th March announced that there would be an embargo on energy imports from Russia. No consultations with the Europeans who are the main importer. 
USA doesn't import as much, but the Europe does, both oil and gas. They are crucially dependent on Russian oil and gas. But without consulting any of them, he announces the embargo and then realizes there is a nightmare. There's a nightmare not uh, only in Europe, but internationally, because energy is an integrated market. It doesn't matter where the disruption is. It's going to affect oil prices all over the world. And lo and behold, the U.S. Amer uh, president sees oil prices going up at home a few months before uh, he is going to face elections in November. And therefore, he comes running, he packs his bag and comes running to the same Saudi Arabia whom he has abused. Earlier, he didn't want to come. He made phone calls. Both the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and the crown prince of Abu Dhabi refused to take his call. Not a single country of West Asia, North Africa has imposed sanctions on Russia. Not one of them has accepted the American global structure of a new Cold War binary. They, are, they have shown extraordinary good sense and maturity compared to this uh, declining hegemon. And that is why he had to come, hat in hand, and went back empty-handed. Because not only did none of the countries accept his agenda, agenda being massively increase oil production so that he can win the election at home, but what about their revenues? They depend on oil. They also pointed out we don't have that surplus capacity that you are talking about because we didn't do the investments uh, that were required all those years ago when you were talking about climate change. We didn't have the resources to invest in these uh, in the development activity. Neither Saudi Arabia nor UAE have the surplus capacity required to make a difference in the global market. What has the United States done now? Gone running to, they've gone running to Iran, a country they have abused for the last 40 years and are desperate now for a nuclear agreement with Iran so that Iranian oil starts entering the global market. All of these restrictions on Iran, Venezuela have occurred due to US sanctions, Venezuela and Russia. All of them are sponsored by the United States. Oh, for all of them, the global community is paying a very heavy price. Biden is only bothered about the Americans and he's bothered about the November election. But see the man scampering around like he's got wild dogs chasing him, going nowhere, rapidly going nowhere. So this is the concern that the quality of leadership that the Americans should have displayed, given their status as the hegemon, has not been forthcoming. It has not been forthcoming for more mm -hmm. several decades. But now it is the world has, the United States has lost so much credibility that most countries in West Asia, North Africa have moved on. They have now started taking uh, diplomatic initiatives which will, which have nothing to do with the Americans. They have all, they, I have referred to these countries as coming of age. For far too long, they were insecure and totally dependent on the Americans. They have moved on quite a bit since then. They are today engaged with each other. Saudi Arabia has had five rounds of dialogue with Iran. That means they're addressing issues directly with each other without looking over the shoulder at the Americans. Turkey, which had its own agenda till recently, mm -hmm. is now engaged with Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. UAE, for its own reasons, has normalized relations with the Israelis. So you find that there is a churn in the region, a diplomatic churn in the region. As a result, you find new relationships are being forced. It, at the center of all of these initiatives is the looming presence of Russia and China. Both these countries, for the last decade, have made a robust effort to, number one, build their bilateral relationship to minimize competition and conflict on the one hand, particularly in Eurasia, and secondly, work together to build relationships with major countries of Asia. Pakistan, Afghanistan, 
Iran and Turkey are already a significant part of this engagement. They have also gone beyond, particularly China, have gone to Saudi Arabia and to uh, Israel and to the UAE as well. Uh, as far as Russia is concerned, they are central to diplomacy in the region. Any, cap, any leader in the region has a serious problem, he consults with Moscow. And mm -hmm. Moscow is a source of stability and good sense as far as West Asia is concerned. Mm -hmm. So you have very significant developments in the region which have nothing to do with the United States today. So there are, as I have said, whatever happens in the region, there are consequences. And these consequences are that large parts of the region have today moved on and are pursuing their interests and their engagements and building alignments on the basis of their own interest. So I'll just come to India uh, a little bit. Uh, now that, like, of course, <coughs> uh, India is also not just a dependent uh, on the oil resources, but also a big consumer, a growing economy, urbanization, all the reasons that make India attractive as a market. And, and India is, of course, friends now with some of these countries, but also uh, strategic relations with the U.S. And, and what would you say about India's foreign policy going from here now with, with where we are? See, India's foreign policy is firmly anchored in strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. During the Cold War, it was referred mm -hmm. to as non-alignment. Mm -hmm. Post-Cold War, we call it strategic autonomy. Basically, the concepts are not dissimilar. It is the assertion of India's right to take decisions with regard to international development on the basis of its national interest. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. Which means that India will not join an existing alignment mm -hmm. because that would commit itself even before any development has taken place, mm. his posture would be committed. Now, the, 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 there is turbulence in the region. There is no doubt about it. And India is facing crucial challenges in this regard. Mm. At some stage, I would say over the last decade, sections of the Indian security establishment became deeply concerned about the asymmetry between Indian and Chinese power, comprehensive national power, as it is referred mm -hmm. A knee-jerk response to this was to build very substantial security relations with the United States. We not only had the four agreements of interoperability for the armed forces, we also began to purchase defense equipment for the United States, and we enhanced our in intelligence cooperation, and we also started doing a very large number of joint exercises. Mm -hmm. All of this is being watched in the region, particularly in Beijing. Mm -hmm. In 2019, India did something even more dramatic. India led from the front in elevating the Quad, the Maritime mm -hmm. Cooperation yeah. Partnership in the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. into raised it to ministerial level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I personally feel, and I have written about it, I personally feel that this was the last straw as far as the Chinese security mm -hmm. establishment was concerned. Mm -hmm. As China saw it in Beijing, India had given up on strategic autonomy and was now part, overtly part of a hostile coalition directed at China. I believe this happened in September 2019. I believe the movement of Chinese troops at Ladakh in April 2020 mm. was a gentle reminder to India mm. that its immediate and long-term security concerns lie not in the India-Pacific, not in the South China Sea, they lie at the undefined border with China. Now, this is the problem that we, mm -hmm. some of the actions that took place, mm -hmm. 
there are other commentators who have got different assessments and i mm. uh, and i have respect for them mm. but i would like to say this is the explanation i have offered and i stand by it today what has happened since then there has been a, to my mind it's not written by other scholars to my mind there is course correction india has moved in 2021 to mm. change the character of war board which was at that time at the beginning of 2021 projected as a security platform directed at china in south china sea taiwan strait and the east sea the sea of japan has now been fundamentally transformed in september 2021 at the summit it is no longer talking about geostrategic concerns nor is it talking about security it is talking about climate change pandemic um, technology yes. cooperation academic scholarships etc mm -hmm. i think this is a very important signal that delhi has given to beijing mm -hmm. and since then you must have seen the remarks of the external affairs minister have been very strong in favor of strategic autonomy mm -hmm. i believe after that in the month of december 2021 president putin made a visit to india and i believe among other things we reaffirmed our defense cooperation energy cooperation etc but i think he indicated to india the need to repair ties with china and to manage the relationship more effectively mm -hmm. and i believe he would have offered a certain russian role in this regard mm -hmm. the reference to the ric the russia india mm -hmm. china mm -hmm. dialogue platform is significant in this regard mm -hmm. i think something similar may have been conveyed to the indian leadership in march 2022 when foreign minister wang yi came to india mm -hmm. how we now move forward since then at the top leadership level external affairs minister level there have been interactions and dialogue in at various fora particularly at brics as well as with the uh, uh, shanghai cooperation organization so yes there have been platform for that india the uh, china has been applauding the fact that we are at least engaged with each other that we are making an effort to move forward the indian external affairs minister has very rightly stated that you must address the issues at the border first and then we can move forward to normalization mm -hmm. i think we are getting my own view with regard to the future is that this is an assertion of indian strategic autonomy that when the united states put pressure upon india to support the americans against russia and become part of the so called coalition of democracies india refused not only did india refuse to join that coalition india became one of the major buyers of russian oil so that russia that used to provide 0.2% of india's oil need is today supplying more than 10% possibly mm. 15% it has become the second largest supplier of oil to india after iraq india has clarified to the international community and particularly to washington dc that we are not going to compromise on our strategic autonomy this does not mean that we are going to the uh, dilute relations with the americans not at all mm -hmm. as for with the problem with regard to china continue and we need to ensure that we have on our side assets and capabilities mm -hmm. that we can use in order to maintain a degree of balance with regard to china but as far as russia is concerned also we have made it very clear that we value that relationship as well i cannot imagine a better manifestation of strategic autonomy than this so i applaud this and i feel it is effective and i think if anyone else but the americans were totally self absorbed and self 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 centered anyone else would have understood where india is coming from our relation our adherence to strategic autonomy did not begin in the last few years it is an article of faith of this country from 1947 anyone else but the american would have understood this 
for them to have sent those useless officials to India, some of whom had the temerity to actually threaten India, I think that indicates a childishness and an mm -hmm. immaturity mm -hmm. that we could have done. Well, I think in the old days that might have, they could have got away with it. But now in the last, at least, at least very recently, I think um, I would say US actions are under increased scrutiny. Um, that is a nice segue actually into the questions that are on chat. I had one last question, but I'm happy to hold up uh, until the very end. So dear, if you will give me a chance, but uh, but uh, Mr. Ahmed, our um, listeners are very keen and there have been questions coming in, in the last 20, so if you, minutes. So. Uh, uh, Meenal, if you have a last question and uh, you can go ahead for let's say 10 more minutes or 5 more minutes and then we'll take so 5 have... more minutes, great, mm -hmm. I will use uh, <laughs> uh, the moderator's uh, privilege uh, my last question is uh, slightly more complex but because we have a lot of young students on the call, I wanted to ask you with COVID and with climate change and the, almost, you know, the collapse of the world order, the war the, 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 what is, whatever is happening in Russia and Ukraine, what is are you hopeful about humanity? Do you feel <laughs> optimistic? Uh, you see, we are, as a people, all of us, we are shaken by the pandemic. The pandemic is a scourge that over two years caused the deaths of so many million people. We saw the harm done in developed countries. So it is not just earlier we used to see epidemics and pandemics in developing countries, Africa, Latin America, Asia, etc. But here developed countries were found seriously wanting. If this scourge was also not respectful of your personal status. Almost everybody we know suffered a personal tragedy. And we seem to not have immediate answers. Yes, the international community came up with vaccines in record time. But the problem with vaccines developed in record time is that they need a much longer period of experimentation. And the virus keeps on mutating. And therefore, while the, the, the manifestation of the illness has not gone away, uh, they, it has become more mild, possibly due to the uh, vaccines that we had taken earlier. But the problem is still with us. And the, the virus is mutating and we cannot rule out the fact that at some stage it may come upon us with a new virulence. Then there is this whole problem of the economy. The global economy is in a shambles. Overnight, most countries did not know how to handle the challenge. Most of us did not know because we were ill-prepared, bureaucracy-minded, etc., short-sighted and self-centered, that large sections of extremely poor people, particularly migrant workers, were very seriously and adversely affected. The global economy collapsed in front of our eyes. And therefore, it had implications for employment. We suddenly found that developing countries have no safety net as a capacity to provide for them. These are the immediate consequences. Mm -hmm. But there are very serious long-term consequences, mm -hmm. many of which are not yet apparent to us. But there is no doubt that the way of life we had earlier has to be fundamentally reviewed. The way we work, the way we study, the way we work, the way we relate with each other, mm -hmm. the kind of gender relationship that we have, is the kind of social economic ties that we have with people, the concerns that we ought to have with regard to the deeply disadvantaged, and the kind of government that we must have. You see, particularly we noticed during the pandemic that populist governments, governments that had come into power on the basis of a promise of a magic wand, whether it was the United States or Brazil or, or Hungary or the United Kingdom, you had these promises made by the leader who said that I will transform the life of ordinary people. And you knew that they were lying. You knew that they didn't have that capacity. But the pandemic showed how thoroughly incompetent they actually were. So the biggest challenge is 
the challenge to governance. At the end of the day, civil society cannot substitute for governance. Governance is paramount. And governance will be judged on the basis of which, uh, on, the, on the basis uh, in terms of its capacity to really uh, influence the lives of ordinary people and give young people particularly a sense of hope for the future. Mm. Is this likely to happen? Number one, you need a fundamental reform of governance at home in the domestic order. Mm. Number two, you must have a really new foreign policy approach, which, which focuses more on, on partnership rather than on competition and conflict. Mm. These both seem to be very idealistic mm. because you know the reality of life is that at the end of the day, the politician has only three commitments and they are me, myself and I. There are no other, there's no other commitment. And that is why it seems like a tall order. But that is where the people have to demand of their leader that enough is enough. That politics as usual, business as usual, economy as usual has to change. Mm -hmm. That you cannot have an old style thinking and mindset in a challenge, in an order that is fundamentally challenged. Corrective measures are taken. They, it is very, very painful. Let me explain to you. There are no easy solutions. You have seen in the case of the United States, post-pandemic, what great hopes we had of Mr. Biden and see the disaster we have experienced. You are also looking at the possible return of Donald Trump. And you see an extremely polarized a deeply divided and extremely vicious and violent bunch of people. And this is the United States. Look at the, uh, Europe. You have the rise of racism. You have the rise of intolerance and non-accommodation also there. In our own country too, there are many challenges, economic, political, and socio-cultural as well. All of this. Therefore, what is needed and what is actually being manifested, there is a very, very deep divide. When we speak of hope, we just don't mean survival. When we speak of hope, we mean, will our young people have a life yeah. that yeah. they deserve? Yeah. Will they have the opportunity to fulfill their potential? Will they, have the, uh, the, uh, will they have a life for themselves and their families that perhaps is an improvement for, in terms of what they saw with the previous generation? That is the challenge. The whole purpose is not life. It is the quality of life that we are able to give to these young people. Now, the last point I'll make in this is life got much harder for young people. You will have, it will be much more competitive. There are no magic wands either with the government or with civil society. There is no shortcut to working much harder than ever before. You are today part of a global community where you will compete with people who are qualified uh, as well as they can. You can only be as, uh, you can fulfill your potential only through very hard study. Demand the maximum from your teachers. May, uh, demand the maximum from yourself. Demand the maximum from your government. And only then will you be able to survive and go through and have the prospect of a life that is better than the one that I had. So, Very powerful message. Thank you. I will pass it to Sudhir now. Sudhir. Thank you. So <laughs> I would like to uh, call uh, uh, Sanjit. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes. Uh, the question I had in mind is that uh, what was the role of OPEC in uh, the trend of oil prices that we have seen in the last 40 years. Okay, got it. Yeah. You can put together, if you don't mind, Sudhir, about four or five questions and I will respond to them in the okay. 20 minutes that I have. Okay, so there is another interesting question that uh, Shalini has. Shalini, if you can quickly ask your question. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so, so my question, I had two questions. Uh, first question I have is, we see a lot of Indians uh, settling in the Middle East countries. 
and primarily uh, among middle east also all the gulf countries the six gulf countries especially we can see this trend uh, quite common in south that people are more and more migrating every year so sir my question is uh, what exactly is attracting so many indians towards these countries is it only because of the oil and coal uh, this sector or is it any other sector that is much not much known about and secondly sir uh, ever since we have got our honorable prime minister mr narendra modi he has been working consistently in improving foreign relations with uh, different nations so sir uh, is that will that impact our relations with the middle east countries in near future because we see middle east countries as a very sensitive area so how will our indian policy is going to affect the indian economy with respect to the different conferences and meetings which we are taking daily uh, on the yearly basis so sir these were my two questions thank you thank you yeah uh, thanks shruti uh, shalini then shruti uh, if you can ask a question quickly so first of all thanks a lot sir for uh, a wonderful uh, wonderful insights over the topic i had two questions firstly what could be the prime reason or factors except the dependence on uh, western power for security which widened the disparity between uh, the interest of the royal family and the interest of the nation and my second question Just was question that, what is the reason for or background of our middle east countries dependence on the west for security or in general or india no no uh, western west middle east uh, middle east country yes yes dependence of middle east countries of on the west on the us for their security yes sir okay and secondly considering the food security issue which has widened the post russian uh, which was widened uh, the po- after the post uh, russian ukraine russia ukraine war what could be done to mitigate its direct and uh, indirect impact on india in particular i think uh... sir you can go ahead with these and right. then i'll take the second bunch of questions well, yeah the first question put to me was about the impact of opec on oil prices yeah opec uh, when it was put together in the uh, 60s as a gathering of oil producing countries as a cabal of oil producing countries opec producers provided about 60% of uh, global oil into the market and their effort was to get fair prices you see at that time their oil production was controlled by western companies that used to reap very high profits from this production but at the same time gave a very small uh, revenue uh, to the countries concerned uh, initially not much happened but from 1973 when the arab Uh, oil producers exercise the oil weapon you find uh, where they cut supplies to uh, countries that supported israel in the 73 war at that time you found that oil prices were increased from 2 dollars per barrel to 4 dollars to 6 dollars 8 dollars and 10 dollars so within a decade there was a five fold increase in the price of oil and obviously as a result there was a massive flow of revenues uh, from the global economy to these oil producers but now there are certain issues that were apparent then and they are apparent now let us be very clear energy is a fuel for the global economy that means and it is a, like any commodity in the global economy the price is determined by de- demand and supply cost of production is not relevant because cost of production is 2 to 4 dollars per barrel and sometimes 8 or 10 dollars per barrel but demand and supply so depending on the state of the global economy you will find the prices will go up and down so even when opec existed at a time when it, con- it controlled 60% of global production uh, you find the prices could swing from very high to very low this has continued this pattern has continued and now opec provides only 40% to the global market 
Now, uh, whatever one major factor that influences oil prices is supply. Now, as technology has become available, we have access to far greater supplies of oil than we had known earlier. For example, in the 1950s, there was an indication from some scholars that we have that oil supplies have peaked. And there was a discussion about peak oil. And then this peak oil kept on increasing uh, because uh, uh, more and more oil was available due to technology. We were able to get oil from wells that had become dry. We were able to get oil from spaces that had not been geographically accessible. Uh, and we were able to get oil from far deeper resources of wells, etc. A whole range of changes have taken place. So as far as the global economy is concerned, there is enough oil potentially available at least till the end of the century. Having said this, you constantly need investment to develop this potential. To develop, but you will invest your money and develop the potential only when you get an indication about future demand. And future demand is very difficult to predict. Two major changes that have occurred in the global energy economy are number one, uh, the uh, massive supply of oil from the United States. Till uh, about 15 years ago, the United States was the largest importer of world oil. Now it is an important exporter of oil, but to a larger extent of gas as well, because of shale oil. So for technology of shale oil, shale oil has made the United States a major producer. And which is why in 2014, when shale oil entered the market, OPEC could not cope with that challenge and prices plummeted from $140 and finally became $30 and could have even become $20. At that stage, OPEC decided to control production. That means there was a global surplus and that it was necessary to control production. As they therefore reduced their production, oil prices started going up. Therefore, from $30, they went to $40, to $50, $60, 2019, they reached even $70, $80. Then you have the second hit, and that is the pandemic. So once again, oil prices plummet because there is no demand. Even if the supply is there, there is no demand for oil because the global economies have taken a beat. In 2021, you start, a, you see a certain recovery. And there is an increase in demand for oil. And then you find that oil is not there. Because during the pandemic, new investment was not done. And nobody expected the pandemic would change demand so quickly. And therefore, oil prices started going up. And you found they became $80 and $90, etc. In February 2022, the United States, uh, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine on 8 March. Uh, United States announced embargo on Russian oil. And immediately, the, a, one major producer of global oil was not allowed to provide the international economy with oil. Oil prices started going up. So from they crossed $100, reached $110, went to $120. Since then, they have come back. They've come back because China is no longer seeking the quantities of oil that it used to earlier. Why is it not seeking them? Because they have a very tight COVID regime. So zero COVID, as they have said. And as a result, oil prices are now $90. But they could become $100 and possibly even go to $110 in case Russian supplies are not allowed. In case Iranian supplies come, you will find oil prices going back to $90. What, how did OPEC manage this challenge? OPEC managed this challenge by going beyond OPEC. They began to cooperate for the first time with Russia at the end of 2016. Therefore, you no longer refer to OPEC, you refer to OPEC+. plus. Therefore, because without Russia and the 10 countries that Russia brought from Central Asia and other places, you could not have coordinated global supply. And since then, OPEC+, plus 
has a central place with regard to a global oil production. They increase oil production and decrease oil production on the basis of their understanding of the market scenario. This is where we are today. The basic point is globally, there is only one oil market. Anything that happens anywhere in the world, it will affect oil prices globally. No one country can say, you must have heard this word a thousand times, energy independence. Even in India, we use the term energy independence. There is no such thing as energy independence. If you want a poetic reference, no man is an island. And therefore, no energy scenario is separate from what is happening in the rest of the world. We are connected with each other. Biden forgot this for a short while when abruptly cut oil uh, supplies from Russia and gas supplies from Russia and created the disaster, a self-created disaster for his own economy, European economy and the global economy. Now, with regard to the question, why do Indians go to the Gulf? Indians were not initially either lured to the Gulf in the 1970s, nor were we there in large numbers. My first posting was in Kuwait, where the Indian community increased from 1,500 to 7,000. And 7,000 in a few months became 10,000. And there was a demand for additional officers in the embassy in those days, you could not create additional force. Therefore, a trainee officer like me was sent to Kuwait basically to help in the consular section and support the embassy to handle the Indian community over there. In the 80s, we find a swing in favor of India. And I have a personal reason to explain this. And that is, Indians were seen as apolitical, not connected with politics. Do recall that these very small oil producing countries of the Gulf were importing people in their millions over a period of time. There was no way they could manage their own security and maintain the integrity of their own community in the midst of such a massive presence of foreigners. Therefore, they preferred the Indian. The Indian came from a democratic and secular order. He had no interest in local politics. He had no interest in extremist politics that had taken over large parts of the Muslim world at that time because of global jihad in Afghanistan. And he was, if he was interested in politics, he was interested in Indian politics. This apolitical character of the Indian shifted the balance, in the, the preference in favor of the Indian. And that is why you find that in 1982 in Saudi Arabia, Indians were 250,000. By 1990, in the same country, Saudi Arabia, Indians had become 1 million. And the others, Yemen, Egypt, and Pakistanis, who used to be much more than Indians, Yemenis were 3 million, Egyptians were 1 million, Pakistanis half million, and Indians quarter million. The Indians became the number one. So the reasons are number one, we were apolitical. All of these others, Egyptian, the Pakistanis, they were active involvement in jihad in Afghanistan. Not a single Indian went to participate in the global jihad in Afghanistan. Not a single Indian participated in the civil conflict and the Taliban period in the 1990s and in the first decade of this century. Therefore, we were able. The second thing that they appreciated about India, we were genuinely qualified. Number three, they found we are a very disciplined people, that we don't get into criminal activity. So they, these were the reasons why Indians became attractive. Why does the Indian go there? The, firstly, in the state of Kerala, which, used, which provided then and even provides the largest contingent of Indians in the Gulf, there is a long history of migration abroad, working in the Gulf. It goes back to the period of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, when from Malabar, you used to have sailors who used to traverse the Arabian Sea 
and go all across the Arabian Peninsula into the Gulf and into the Red Sea. Many large parts of that region, then the historical connectivity is very deep. Therefore, Kerala had a tradition. This tradition continued when there was a demand for human resources from the Gulf. This now, today I have, we have eight and a half million Indians who live in the Gulf. We are the number one expatriate community in every country of the Gulf. In three countries out of six, Indians are the majority community. In the UAE, when the Emirati is 10%, mm -hmm. the Indian is 40% in mm -hmm. the Gulf, in, in the UAE. We are also the majority community in, the, in uh, Qatar and in Bahrain. In every other community, we are the number one expatriate community. This community sends back to India about $35 billion every year. This every one worker in the Gulf supports minimum of four people at home. That means 40 million Indians directly benefit from this employment in the Gulf. Over the last 25 years, we have noticed that there is a change in the profile of the community. And that Indian who earlier used to be blue-collar workers, 80 to 90 percent were blue-collar workers. Today, blue-collar workers are about 60 percent. When the community has changed in 1990, the total Indians were 3 million. In 2000, we were 6 million. Then we became 7 million. And by 2020, we were 8.5 million. Mm -hmm. The profile has changed. And today we are, we have at least 20% of our community is made up of professionals. So there is a very strong vote in favor of Indians. The next question was, what is the relationship that we have? The relationship that we have is complex. In my book, there is a whole chapter devoted to India's ties with West Asia. I will very quickly make the point that Mr. Modi uh, made a very major effort to reach out to the region and to build political and economic relations with the region. He focused on the region. He visited all the major countries and invited their leaders back home to India. These regional leaders have responded very actively. The basis of the relationship is number one, energy. India gets 60 to 70 percent of its energy requirements from the Gulf. The GCC provides 50 percent. The balance comes from Iran and from Iraq. Iran has now become zero, but it's going to pick up shortly. Iraq is a very major supplier as well. India buys about 70 or 80 percent through term contract. The balance we buy through spot market, from the open market. And sometimes when prices are volatile, Indians buy more from the spot market. So, yes, the relationship is very substantial. There is now, over the last 10 years, a substantial political content to the relationship. This relationship has nothing to do with the region's ties with Pakistan. Pakistan has its own separate relationship with the region that goes back to the Cold War. In the Cold War period, Pakistan, so United States and this region were partners. In the, as part of the Western alliance against the Soviet Union. So if weaponry or the uh, equipment was supplied, defense equipment was supplied by the United States, it was similar to what the United States supplied Pakistan. Pakistan used to do a lot of training. India was on the opposite side as far as the Cold War is concerned. This political relationship began to change. Uh, and by the time you come to Dr. Manmohan Singh's visit, we are talking about a strategic partnership. Mr. Modi has built up on this strategic partnership. Our strategic partnership is anchored in counterterrorism. The region understands that they and we share the same challenge of extremism uh, uh, and therefore uh, that emanates from Pakistan. While they may not publicly castigate Pakistan, they understand India's position that we are victims today because Pakistan has been the sanctuary and nursery of extremism. And that is the pattern. It continues. 
the economic side is more substantive energy, investment, trade, and above all, community. These are the pillars of the relationship. We are also have talked in the past, but not have made the required progress with regard to building logistical connectivity. We don't have that kind of logistical. We were supposed to have from Chabahar. In, 19, in 2003, Iran offered Chabahar port to India and to build connectivity to Afghanistan, Central Asia, and Russia. But unfortunately, in 2004, the Manmohan Singh government prioritized the nuclear agreement over the relationship with Iran. And as a result, you find that we were not able to pursue those connectivity projects. I very often remind my friend that we had these connectivity projects going from south to north across Eurasia 10 years before Xi Jinping talked about One Belt, One Road. He talked about One Belt, One Road in 2030. We, if we had these projects in, already in place, it would have been Xi Jinping seeking to work with India in order to meld the, the south-north connectivity projects that we have with the east-west projects that he was envisaging under Belt and Road. In the absence of any Indian effort at completing these projects across Eurasia, today we have given China a free hand with regard to Belt and Road. And that is what they are taking advantage of. Even now, despite Mr. Modi's visit to Tehran and the trilateral agreement to have the development of Chabahar and to have connectivity to Afghanistan and Central Asia, hardly any progress has taken place with regard to logistical connectivity project. Therefore, we, have, we continue to build on that. We hope for the best. But as of now, the relationship is largely economic in character and the political content is largely connected with counter-terrorism, though we are doing a lot more uh, with regard to maritime security as well. Why are these countries dependent on the United States for their security? As I mentioned in my remark, the countries that took shape in the post-First World War and post-Second World War were overwhelmingly insecure. It was never envisaged by their sponsor that they would ever be truly independent. Imagine the structure of Pakistan. Pakistan was never going to be a country capable of looking after its own security. It became an integral part of the Western alliance almost immediately after birth. Similarly, in the case of Israel, Israel was such a small country, it was never going to become an independent country as far as security is concerned. It is consistently dependent on the United States. Similarly, the countries of West Asia and the Gulf, particularly of the Gulf country. The Gulf countries are so small and vulnerable that they depend crucially on their alliance with the West. Up to 1968 to 70, security in the Gulf was the responsibility of the United Kingdom. But when the United Kingdom announced that they would be withdrawing east of Suez, the countries were formed and given a certain shape. They were given borders, they were given institutions of governance, and a modality of uh, governance were also put in place. But they were never stable and secure. As the British withdrew, the responsibility for security in the region was assumed by the MN as part of the Cold War. And therefore, these countries became dependent on the Americans for their security as part of the Cold War. And that pattern continued. It is only in the last decade where the, uh, the region has seen, a, has experienced a serious loss of credibility as far as America's role as a security provider is concerned. America made very major mistakes, both with, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as a result, it not only spent a lot of money, it exhausted its enthusiasm as far as the region is concerned. And therefore, as I have already stated, the region is now seeking to pursue its own interests on the basis of their own diplomatic effort. 
And that is the background in which they no longer buy the Cold War binary put being advocated by Joe Biden and instead are talking about multipolarity, a multipolar world order where they have the freedom to interact with Russia, with China, the United States, and with a host of other countries that are emerging on the world stage. The last question is about food security. I think we discussed this in considerable yes, yes, detail yes. already. Yes. And I would uh, say that you have an expert in Minal right there and who knows a lot more than I do. Therefore, please do direct this question to her at some stage. Okay. So if you don't mind, I think it's a good time for us to pause and I hand over control to Mr. Sudhir Pandey. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are already uh, at 5.30 and, and we, we request you for five more minutes. Uh, one last question that I'll put up because most of the questions we've already answered. If a lot of people are asking uh, uh, about Pelosi's vis visit to uh, the uh, uh, Taiwan, what has been the kind of dynamics and how is it affecting all of us or how is it going to shape up? So if you can answer that question and after that... Uh, we I'm going like to, to answer that question seriously. Though it may sound flippant. But it is a serious answer. Thank you. Madam Nancy Pelosi is all of 82 years. She is the grand dame of US politics. That grand matriarch has now reached her sunset. And she desperately needed to go out with a bank. Therefore, this visit to Beijing, not at all encouraged even by Joe Biden, was Nancy Pelosi's personal project. It's a project that would she would then move off the world stage with a bank. She believes in this. She believes in herself. She was a tough speaker, took Trump on. She's a toughie. No doubt about that. But the toughie has now, it is, you could say the lioness is in winter. So there is, I don't believe any strategic value whatsoever in Nancy Pelosi's initiative. But and here I must ring alarm bells. These, F, these initiatives that are taken by private, by individuals, for personal reasons or domestic political reasons, have implications that go well beyond. For the Chinese, Taiwan is a red line. Just as Jammu and Kashmir is a red line for us. It's a domestic issue. How they deal with Taiwan is something between them and the Taiwanese. What you have found now, and I, it's a matter of concern for me, Beyond Nancy Pelosi, the United States is encouraging a confrontation with China on the lines of the confrontation it encouraged with Russia with regard to Ukraine. Ukraine is a different scenario. Ukraine was a sovereign country, member of the United Nations a major role player in global security, global food security. You can have serious concerns about the expansion of NATO. But the status of Ukraine is separate. Taiwan is an integral part of China and is accepted globally as part of government's acceptance of one China policy. A one-China policy that is accepted even by the United States. Nobody says that you must change Taiwan's character militarily. But nobody also says that you must encourage Taiwan and a set of politicians in Taiwan to edge towards declaring independence. Because then you are aggravating the security scenario as far as the uh, West Pacific is concerned. Therefore, I am concerned. I would recommend very strong. So Nancy Pelosi has gone into the sunset, but I have seen, then immediately you must have seen uh, another gang of American politicians showed up. 
again domestic politics because they are going to face elections in November. Many of these obscure politicians have not been heard of. You know that most of the American congressmen don't even have a passport, don't even know which countries they are in. So you have a problem. The United States, my own understanding, and I'm going to speak very frankly here, my own understanding is many aspects of U.S. policy are determined by, motivated by, impelled by domestic consent. I would say over here that the most significant force in U.S. affairs is the arms lobby. The arms lobby in the United States has a direct vested interest in encouraging and aggravating tension. And I am very deeply concerned with regard to this business fooling around in Taiwan. There are three issues here. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang and Tibet. All of these are viewed by China as domestic issues. Just as India views the Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast region as domestic issues. And we would be equally upset if any country fooled around with the status of these, of these states in the Indian Union. So I think that there is a need for good sense here. I am concerned about it. We have to go beyond Pelosi. You see what Ukraine does. There was absolutely no reason for the Americans to encourage NATO membership of Ukraine. Because a red line has been stated. And if you remember in June last year, Putin and Biden had a meeting in Geneva. After that, Biden addressed a press conference where he stated he understands Putin's red line on Ukraine. If you remember correctly, if you remember, we were so deeply agitated when Pakistan joined the CENTO and Seattle and brought the Cold War to our border. If you were sitting in Moscow, you would have exactly the same kind. This deliberate expansion of NATO to throttle Russia is not accepted. And what they are, the American game plan is fight the Russian to the last Ukraine. And that's what they are doing today. Harming the global economy, you, you will find Ukraine will take years and decades to recover. You have seen the consequences of war in Syria and in Yemen. The countries are devastated by war. Hundreds of thousands of people are killed, institutions destroyed, edifices brought down. It's not easy to repair and reconstruct. And the enthusiasm that the international community has for war and the resources it pours into war are never, never, never matched by the resources for rehabilitation and reconstruction. Never. You would read the literature. How much weaponry is now being developed all across Western Europe and the United States. Defense budgets have gone up by several times. Who benefits from this? The, the vile and vicious villain I mentioned, the arms lobby. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for giving that 10 minutes extra. We are grateful to you. Now I request uh, uh, Professor Meenal Patak to uh, say the closing remarks and... Uh, I would never want to to uh, close after such an uh, engaging session. And I think I, I would just water down the messages. I will just stop here. And I think it was a great talk, very insightful. And everyone in the audience, and especially our colleagues and students at Ahmedabad University, are just absolutely honored and delighted. And we hope to see you in person very soon. Thank you, Siddhi, also. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the invitation. I have followed in the long line of extremely distinguished people. And I was extremely hesitant whether I would even minimally meet the standards that they have already set. Therefore, I'm grateful to you for having had uh, some faith in me and giving me this opportunity and platform to put across some thoughts to you and to the young people who are part of your university and who are all around in the state of Gujarat. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We are really delighted to have you. And I can see the messages. You have clarified a lot of doubts that we have. 
<laughs> and we thought that it could go on and on and on like that, but we had the time constraint. So see you soon in October in person. We are really eager. If you folks to... know anyone in RRU, I'm going to give 15 lectures in RRU. Yeah. Oh, in a two-week period. So, but I'll uh, give one lecture to you. Uh, yes. If you, if you, <laughs> Thank you so you much. See the one, you see the one I had offered you in the Western neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. But uh, that lecture is still there. So I have mm -hmm. a PowerPoint ready. We can talk about that. Thank you so yes. much. Yeah. All right. Thank I you so much. Today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Right. Thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. on All Saturday right. evening, everybody is joined. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank and you. see you soon. All the best. Uh, next time.